So, welcome back, everybody. I hope you had a good lunch. Um, this afternoon, I'm going to start by giving you a talk on new insights and future directions. And um, if you can keep your questions till the end, I think we'll have plenty of time to do that. So this talk will cover, give an overview on what kind of research is going on at the moment and what is planned in the near future. We'll talk a bit about how you can participate in research, how you should approach and speak to your doctors about that, and how research translates into what happens in the clinic. We do quite a lot of translational research in our unit, i.e. taking stuff from the bench to the bedside, so to speak, taking ideas and um, beginning to do experiments in patients, which are what clinical trials are. Clinical trials are experiments, and it's important to fully understand what you're letting yourself in for. The take-home messages are that there are new treatments working their way through the process, some of them at a very advanced stage. I think over the next th just few years, we're going to have many new agents. And for the first time, drugs which have been specifically tested in patients with amyloidosis. At the, you've heard that the drugs we use now as chemotherapy in AL amyloidosis are being adapted from their use in myeloma. Well, we may be talking about the same drugs, but they will have gone through clinical trials looking specifically at their benefits and risks and side effects in patients with amyloidosis. One way that you can help is make views known through surveys, which you're often asked to fill in in waiting rooms this may feel tedious, but it is really helpful. And, of course, you can make voluntary comments back anonymously or otherwise to your healthcare workers. You've heard, regrettably, that AL amyloidosis is incurable. Well, you know, there are patients who have incredibly prolonged remissions, but the expectation is that the plasma cell disorder will become active once again at some stage. And the treatment, and the disease rather, needs to be thought of as a chronic disorder requiring long-term management, but um, there are many treatments available. You've heard from Helen that there are many important aspects of supportive care one of which, as you've heard, um, is fluid balance, which is incredibly important, and often patients are receiving mixed and incorrect messages. Research is important, and we would encourage patients to part participate in research, whether that is qualitative questionnaires or questionnaires about quality of life, to studies. Every patient who comes with AL amyloidosis to our center is asked to, um, to um, give their permission to join our so-called alchemy study, which is the AL chemotherapy study, which is a so-called observational study. We are simply asking you if we can use your anonymized clinical data to make analyses about the outcomes and effect of treatment in the disease. So this alchemy observational study, which most patients um, do sign up to, doesn't affect anything that happens to you, but it allows us to use your data in an anonymous way. And thus, we learn from real-world experience in hundreds and thousands of patients which is never the number of patients who are going to be involved in amyloidosis trials. In a really big AL amyloidosis trial, there might be 200 patients, that kind of number, uh, half or a third of whom will be randomized, potentially, to some kind of standard care. So we've actually learned a great deal from this observational study, and there are all sorts of studies that are not clinical trials of new drugs as such. And so please give consideration to joining things. 
So what are we looking at? Well, diagnosis is incredibly important. 15, 20 years ago, at least 5 or 10% of patients with AL amyloidosis were being misdiagnosed. We learned that a proportion of patients, in fact, had other types of amyloidosis, hereditary types and so on, in which chemotherapy was simply not even appropriate. We are, we are now supremely confident in almost every single patient about making the diagnosis of AL amyloidosis. But you've heard that there is a big spectrum between monoclonal gammopathy and myeloma and, um, and uh, where the uh, amyloidosis falls along that line. What we hope in future is to make patient-specific diagnoses. What is the nature of the plasma cells in a particular patient? Everybody has normal plasma cells in their bone marrow, making immunoglobulins and light chains, healthy immunoglobulins. These are the natural antibodies that exist in your blood. And in fact, about half of your blood protein, or nearly half of your blood protein, is natural antibodies. So plasma cells are a normal thing. And what happens in this disease, and what happens to cause aging, and to cause cancer, and to cause all sorts of other things, is that cells develop mutations in their DNA along the course of your life. And plasma cells may require, you know, one mutation may not disrupt the DNA enough to cause a problem, but a sequence of random mutations can lead to a line of abnormal plasma cells evolving. And so, you know, there is potential for genetic studies on plasma cells to identify certain features which might have certain correlations with the disease or indeed response to chemotherapy. Patients with certain plasma cell genotypes, so to speak, might respond better to one type of chemotherapy or completely fail to respond to another. <clears throat> so bit by bit, this kind of work is making diagnosis tailored towards each individual patient. Monitoring of disease is incredibly important, and you've heard that we're really talking about two different things. We're monitoring the plasma cell disorder itself, not usually by serial bone marrows, unfortunately, but by measuring the abnormal proteins made by the plasma cells which form the amyloid, and we measure these things in the blood and the urine. These are the free light chains. The free light chain test only came into being about 17 or 18 years ago and has really revolutionized the management of this disease. We can see month by month, cycle by cycle of chemotherapy, what the light chains are doing. And the light chains are the amyloid forming protein. And the aim of treatment is all about the knockdown, how much one is knocking down the production of the amyloid forming light chains. There are still people developing new light chain assays. At the moment, the free light chain assay that you all have measured is also measuring the low level of healthy light chains. Well, they kind of get in the way and it would be really nice if we had tests that just simply measured the abnormal amyloid forming light chain. It would give a clearer result which you, me, everyone in this room would be able to interpret that bit more easily. So this, this kind of work is going on. Chemotherapy treatments are treatments designed to reduce the production of new amyloid forming protein, i.e. to slow down or stop the buildup of amyloid in the organs. What we need in addition are drugs and treatments that help the body clear away the amyloid that's already there. We know that that does go on, but it goes on at a very low rate, but a rate that varies quite considerably from patient to patient. When we can turn off production of amyloid completely and follow up patients for years, some patients barely clear away the amyloid that's there at all. Others can clear away half of the amyloid 
in the course of a year. So, and one can only know that when one follows up patients after treatment. But of course, it would be great if we could predict what that was going to look like before we started treatment. If we knew that you were a patient who had the ability to clear away amyloid very well, we would be less picky about just how much we needed to suppress the light chains. We wouldn't go the extra mile if it was going to carry great risks. We want to develop safer treatments. The treatments out there today have all sorts of adverse effects. And we want to really learn how to use the treatments more effectively, i.e. There, there could be potentially three, four, five different drugs being used together in a patient, and we need to learn how to use those combinations to their best advantage. Getting um, perspectives of patients is incredibly important along the way. One thing that we've been developing in our unit is is this thing, proteomics. So the standard way of confirming what type of amyloid protein a patient has, is this AL, pro, AL amyloid, ATTR amyloid, A, A amyloid, or some hereditary form or whatever, is so-called immunohistochemistry. Biopsies are cut into thin slices. Under the microscope, we stain the amyloid with certain chemicals, and then we do immunohistochemistry. These are antibody stains, and in AL amyloidosis, a patient's amyloid should stain with a labeled antibody to kappa light chains or lambda light chains. And that is the classical and most widely used way of confirming that you have got AL amyloidosis. We never rely on one test. I mean, we would never make a diagnosis of AL amyloidosis if the immunohistochemistry suggested that, but there was no plasma cell dyscrasia, the amyloid was in a peculiar part of the body that we don't normally see in AL amyloid. We put the whole thing together. Every single test we do, scans, blood tests, biopsy tests, have got their limitations. And that's why we put patients through a whole series of things and then build up the whole picture and discuss you in our multidisciplinary team meeting before we come up with a confirmed final diagnosis. What proteomics enables us to do is an additional test beyond staining biopsies. We actually cut out tiny, tiny little areas of amyloid from the biopsies using a so-called laser dissecting microscope and then identify the protein using a test called mass spectrometry. So this is a completely different and complementary way of confirming that the amyloid protein is a kappa or lambda light chain or some other protein in other types of amyloid. A very big advance has been with cardiac MRI. Up until quite recently, amyloid in the heart has been difficult to really understand. It's been, the, 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 the standard test was echocardiography, which is an ultrasound of the heart, which is a pretty good test in many ways, but it can never tell us how much of the thickened heart wall is heart muscle and how much of it is the buildup of amyloid between the muscle cells. The cardinal feature of AL amyloid in the heart is the heart wall becomes thickened and stiff. What cardiac MRI is able to do, especially, most especially, in the very capable hands of our team here, led by Mariana Fontana, who is chairing, or is going to be there for you to ask her questions in the cardiac session, if she has arrived. She has arrived. If she hasn't delivered before then, she will answer your questions. Um, so, cardiac MRI is a fantastic test, and it has been the latest big development in our unit. We've got our own cardiac MRI uh, department staffed by an ever-increasing team. And 
Cardiac MRI can measure the amount of amyloid between the heart muscle cells. This is quite an amazing thing. It can also tell us how the amyloid is damaging the heart muscle. Is it actually interfering with the blood supply to the heart? We are going to learn a great deal from cardiac MRI. And what we've already learned is that AL amyloid in the heart can naturally regress. Echocardiograms almost never showed this, even two, three, four years after chemotherapy that completely suppressed the amyloid light chains being made. We could never really understand that, but either it meant that amyloid in the heart was never cleared by the body, and that's what we began to believe. But cardiac MRI has shown a completely different picture. It shows that the amyloid can regress, even something like half the patients within a year and then the muscle cells are recovering, so the heart wall isn't necessarily becoming any thinner. It's been a really important thing to learn that amyloid is being cleared away in the heart, although this is definitely at a very low rate, lower than in the kidneys and the spleen and the, the liver. So there's a bit of a pecking order there. Amyloid is being cleared slowly in the heart, and, but it is being cleared. And that opens up the possibility of speeding up that natural clearance. <clears throat> I think I've really covered this. I mean, the, this um, is talking about new blood tests to try and measure the light chains more specifically than we can do even with the free light chain assay. Disease monitoring will inevitably or may inevitably necessitate bone marrows to be performed because that's where the plasma cells are. And unlike in patients with the myeloma cancer, there aren't many abnormal plasma cells there. They don't get into the blood, or at least in such small numbers we can't usefully measure them there. So looking at the plasma cells themselves requires bone marrows to, 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 to find them and purify them and uh, learn about the mutations and changes that are going on there. So as I've already said once today, having a bone marrow is not something one volunteers for necessarily, but it is incredibly informative and we do have bone marrow research studies um, going on. I mean, this can give this can give very important information on you as an individual patient as well as contributing to wider research. So chemotherapy is a bit of a... It's not very targeted, really. I mean, chemotherapy drugs are poisonous to other cells. The idea is chemotherapy drugs are more poisonous to the abnormal plasma cells than normal plasma cells or indeed any other normal cell in the body. But patients with AL amyloidosis, by the time they are diagnosed, have got problems in one or several different organs. And it's inevitable that giving chemotherapy is going to make you worse before it makes you better. The only way it can make you better is by killing the plasma cells, which may take one, two, three, four months. And then even that's not going to make anything better until more time has gone by and there has been some natural clearance of the amyloid, or at least time for the damaged organs to start healing once no further amyloid is building up in them. Even if the amyloid is not being cleared away, the organs can very often show some improvement just when the supply of new amyloid has been stopped. In other words, they're not being constantly more and more damaged. They can somehow begin to make a recovery. So natural clearance of amyloid is certainly not everything. One would like to have chemotherapy drugs that were much more specific for killing the plasma cells. And we have got some trials going on. ASHU is leading a very novel trial 
using radioactive substances that localize in the bone marrow to kill the plasma cells, but which don't go to other parts of the body. Sure, they will do damage to the bone marrow, like chemotherapy, but hopefully the radioactive way of killing cells won't harm other organs. This study, Dash always has funny names for his um, studies, that's called TRALAR or something. TRALAR, which stands for something. I prefer naming them other ways. But anyway, like alchemy, that's a brilliant name because I came up with that one. <laughs> AL chemotherapy, it's kind of obvious. So we want, we want kinder treatments, treatments that have fewer side effects one way or the other by targeting the amyloid better or by not damaging other organs, etc. Or merely just treatments that are poisons but um, don't have the same side effects as many of the drugs we have now. The drugs we do have now an ever-increasing number of new drugs are being developed for myeloma, which we adopt for AL amyloid. They have different side effects. And so if a patient, for example, has amyloid causing nerve damage, we might wish to recommend that you don't receive Velcade because Velcade can and often does cause a degree of nerve damage. So one might select the drugs according to what kind of side effects are anticipated in particular patients. But, you know, there are new drugs coming along that might be able to kill plasma cells with far fewer side effects than the drugs we use at the moment. We've still got a great deal to learn about how chemotherapy drugs work together. One thing that many of you will know is that high-dose steroids, the potent steroid called dexamethasone, greatly increases the effect of many chemotherapy drugs, like Velcade and lenalidomide, and indeed most chemotherapy drugs. It's actually, a chemo it's actually acting as a chemotherapy drug in this setting, and its effect with other drugs is, can be synergistic. They can help each other work better. But steroids give a lot of side effects, and a lot of the problems we see early on in treatment can be attributed to the steroid. Fluid retention is a very major side effect, um, as well as the psychological effects and poor sleep and all the rest of it that steroids can bring. So it would be great to have treatments that didn't involve steroids. And of course, the one treatment we definitely have got that doesn't involve steroids is stem cell transplantation. High, uh, a single dose, high dose of melphalan drug sufficient to largely kill off the bone marrow followed by infusion of your previously purified healthy bone marrow stem cells. Stem cell transplantation has had a difficult ride because it's very logical it works very well in many patients, it gives long remissions, but it carries many risks. We know now how to select patients much better. And as you mentioned that maybe 10, 15% of AL amyloidosis patients um, could, have, could safely consider having a stem cell transplant with very minimal risk to their lives. So we want to create a new stem cell transplant program, and we would like that to happen at UCH, where the myeloma stem cell transplants are performed, and ASHU is um, working on that at the moment. So this is an option we will be talking to you about more in future. We need to catch up a bit and, um, and, and, and bring that back into the mix. I'll mention a bit about the treatments which are in trial already that speed up the body's natural clearance of amyloid. So what we're working towards is the right treatment in the right patient at the right time. And there is as much art to this as science, given all of the variable things. The two things... The only, perhaps, perhaps the only two things that ultimately matter 
our quantity of life, i.e. how long you survive with this disease, and quality of life. And this is quite a difficult balance to really make sense of when you're faced with this or any other serious disease. For example, how much would you take a risk with a small risk of dying during a stem cell transplant, which may be a 2% risk to your life, up to a 5% risk to your life, for the benefits that the treatment is over and done with in just a few weeks. It may take a few months to get your strength back. And if you have a good response, which is that there's a high probability of that, you are likely to have the longest remissions. So there's a decision there to make, isn't there, between taking a risk to your life, which maybe you wouldn't be taking with monthly chemotherapy options, and then the chemotherapy, you know, you may need to have three, six, eight cycles of treatment. You may relapse in two years and need a different chemotherapy drug. So it's really important to, to gauge patients' understanding and views on that. And I think that's a really, really big ask. But there are some patients who are simply gung-ho. I want the strongest possible treatment. I'm looking at one. Now she can tell that I'm looking at her who we advised shouldn't do this, but of course she did, and she's been very well for a long time. Um, well, that's possibly not entirely correct, but, you know, there, was, there, is, there are patients who are willing to take upfront risks um, uh, and others who are absolutely not. So this is the treatment, the, the new cell. I might have, no, I think it's all right, this is recording me. Um, this is the treatment pathway. An idea comes up in the laboratory based on some kind of basic science and a new drug idea is, comes into being. And so a drug then is tested in animals, it's tested in tons of different laboratory tests to predict its toxicity, to predict whether it's a drug that could be absorbed. Is it a drug that's got a long shelf life? Is it difficult to manufacture? Might it carry risks to unborn children? Might it be sensitive to daylight and go off in the bottle? You know, there are so many things involved in deciding whether something identified in the lab that looks as if it can kill plasma cells could actually be turned into a real world medicine. If after some years, and it's usually years, it is decided that's the case, then clinical trials will take place. Firstly, phase one. So these are first into human studies, usually. The drug might have been used in something else, but may not have been used in any other human before. Phase one trials look at the administration of the drug, what happens to the drug in the blood, how it's broken down, what kind of doses can be tolerated by patients without side effects. And a phase one trial might begin to look at some kind of useful effect of the drug, but that is way down the list of what one is trying to achieve in phase one. In phase two, if it passes phase one, we'll have learned the maximum tolerated amount of drug that can probably be given. Phase two studies will look for some kind of clinical benefit. Is it killing plasma cells? Is it, uh, well, that's the main clinical effect. Most um, chemotherapy drugs in this situation will be, will be, we will be looking for. And then if that's successful, phase three is a, if you like, a full-blown clinical trial looking for clinical efficacy, effectiveness, and safety in the population one wants to treat, i.e., patients with AL amyloidosis, and one will have some kind of control group who may receive conventional standard of care chemotherapy. There will usually or hopefully be some randomization, and it will be done in a blinded fashion so that the 
team doing the trial, the doctors, nurses, everyone else, doesn't know who's getting the new treatment and who's getting the standard treatment. And then, when phase three is successful, i.e. it has met its so-called primary endpoint, which is, you know, the measure of efficacy that one is looking for, Hopefully the drug can then be licensed either in the States by the FDA or the European Medicines Agency, the EMA, which will allow the company to sell the drug to the medical market. Unfortunately, every new drug for a rarish disease, and AL amyloid still counts as a very rare disease, the companies will not actually be able to sell much of this drug, will they? Because there are not many patients with the disease. So inevitably, every new drug for a rare disease turns out to be to carry a high cost. And the cost of course of Velcade, 40, now to 50,000 pounds, 30, 40, lenalidomide, 50,000, and that's a drug that might be given as an ongoing thing. There are new drugs like that are coming through in myeloma, which we hope will come on to AL amyloid, that cost well in excess of 100,000 a year. It could be very soon that we would like to prescribe a combination of these drugs, which in the first year after diagnosis could easily cost a quarter of a million pounds. Myeloma is one of, is, is, has been evaluated in all of these respects, whereas AL amyloidosis hasn't. So we just kind of tag on to what we're allowed to give to patients with myeloma. But myeloma is recognized as one of the most expensive cancers to treat with new drugs. And um, new, new treatments have to go through this horrible bit the health technology assessment. And I mean horrible in the sense that a drug is going to be heavily scrutinized and the bodies, this might be done jointly through NHS England and the National Institute for Healthcare Excellence, NICE, will come up with an opinion on whether this drug should be funded by the NHS. In Scotland, they do things differently. In Wales, they do things differently. In Northern Ireland, they do things differently. And at the moment, um, Scotland gives patients a better deal in many respects than patients in England, for example, at least in, with some certain drugs. So this process can take a year or something, and then we will be told what we're allowed to prescribe to our patients. And then we will begin to use these drugs in the clinic. We might discover things that weren't obvious in the clinical trial of a couple of hundred patients. A phase three clinical trial in AL amyloidosis may involve only 100 patients with the disease. A clinical trial with a new blood pressure tablet would be thousands of patients. So, you know, side effects that occur in one in 100 people may simply have been missed, or benefits that may occur in patients. They weren't really looking for them in the trial, we may begin to see in the clinic. And we may find when we're allowed to give drugs in various combinations of our choice that there are particular advantages or disadvantages. So it takes a while in the real world to learn what's going on. And we get a lot of that information in our alchemy long-term observational well-known study. So here are some of the drugs. You've seen this slide before. Carfilzomib is a second or third generation um, proteasome inhibitor, son, grandson of Velcade. It's more potent. It looks very promising combined with thalidomide and dexamethasone in myeloma. A trial is ongoing in the UK um, that ASHU is is uh, leading. Ixazomib is an oral proteasome inhibitor, again, that works on the same kind of lines as Velcade. And of course, it's a 
advantage if any medicine can be given orally. These two bottom ones are so-called monoclonal antibodies. Well, it, it's a bit ironic in a way that amyloid is a disease caused by the build-up of aberrant bits of antibody that the body shouldn't be making. Light chains are part, are part of an antibody. The body's making them in error, in an abnormal form, and um, the light chain aggregates form amyloid. But many new drugs are monoclonal antibodies. They, these are synthetically made antibodies that are able to target cells of one kind or another and then evoke some kind of response. And this one is the, the NEO-D001 antibody is now in phase three. It's produced by the company called Prothena. There are two trials called Vital and, and um, Pronto, Vital and Pronto. One in patients receiving the antibody in addition to chemotherapy when they're first diagnosed with AL amyloid and the other giving the antibody to patients who have finished their treatment who don't need any more chemotherapy to see whether giving monthly courses of this antibody can help clear away amyloid more quickly than it would ordinarily happen. These two, tr these two trials, there are a couple of hundred patients each. I have to refer to Ashu for some of the details, as you can see. A couple of hundred patients each. They're both nearly finished, and we will hear during the next 12 months or so, the first one in about April, whether this antibody therapy is succeeding in speeding up the natural clearance of amyloids. We, um, we have absolutely no idea whether it is or not. Some of the patients of the Royal Free are enrolled and participating in these studies. We don't know so much about the activity of this drug. It has been, you know, drug companies can keep stuff to themselves. They don't necessarily release detailed information about how their drugs work because of commercial sensitivities. So we don't really know what this antibody is doing, but in experimental mouse models it did something and it's being tolerated very well by patients and hopefully it will have a great effect on speeding up the clearance of amyloid. This one over here, desimizumab, is the antibody that's been developed by GSK on the back of about three decades' work in our own laboratory. This is an antibody that binds to SAP. SAP is the blood protein you've all got. We radio label it because it sticks to amyloid. But this antibody we know binds very nicely to SAP and we've previously developed another drug which you give before this to remove SAP from the blood. So it's all very complicated, clever stuff. But we do know in our phase one study that the combination of the SAP blood depleter, the desimizumab, given afterwards, which then sticks to the amyloid, we know that this can clear away amyloid in the liver incredibly well. In just a few weeks, a large amount of amyloid in the liver disappears. Why did we choose the liver? Well, we chose it because we can measure what's going on in the liver better than any other organ. We can feel the liver size at the bedside, which is a big clue. We can perform scans to see how big the liver is from the amyloid. We can measure the amount of amyloid in the liver from, by SAP scans before and after. We can measure how stiff the liver is with a machine called the fibrous scan, which we're now doing on um, patients routinely as they come through the clinic. Furthermore, the clever cardiac MRI methods for measuring the amount of amyloid between heart muscle cells works for the liver. So we can also use cardiac M well, MRI for measuring the amyloid load in the liver. And all these things got better. That was a really complicated phase one trial, but it did, um, it did um, prove the point. And it's now in phase two in patients with cardiac amyloid. This is a small study first in patients with cardiac TTR, ATTR amyloid. We chose that for the first cardiac study, 
because these patients do not have amyloid in other organs and it was going to be more straightforward to try and work out what was going on in the heart. I've covered that. How do you find out about new treatments? Well, Myeloma UK, use the website and it has information about these new drugs. Don't hesitate to call up the Myeloma UK info line or to speak to Darren, our specialist nurse, or any of the doctors. This is, there's plenty of information out there on the Myeloma UK website. Who's in the room? <laughs> yes or no, are you in the room? Are you still with us? <laughs> well, no. <laughs> Have you had a conversation with your doctor or nurse about clinical trials? Well, you know, mixed bag, more yeses than noes, but not a lot of responders. So please always ask. Anyone on a clinical trial? You. Well, you're all on alchemy, or at least if you've signed the consent form for that, which doesn't involve you doing anything, which is a really important clinical study where we're compiling this huge wealth of information from loads of patients. Would you recommend it to other patients? Well, you have to say yes now, don't you, after this talk. Well, you don't need to put your things up. I mean, a clinical trial may enable you, if it's a phase two trial, to definitely get the drug, the new drug. If it's a phase three trial, it might mean that you have to be, take the chance of being randomized to placebo. But it's all for the greater good, and it might not have been the best thing to get the new drug. That has happened, of course. Improvements are filtering through. It's only, you know, it doesn't feel like that from day to day when we're working. Um, but, you know, when we, when we come to this meeting every year, we're seeing new things, phase three trials, near completion, stuff is happening. And it is, you know, has real possibilities of translating into the clinic, i.e. you getting the medicines within a very short time period. You can listen to our talks and things and many other ones on the myeloma TV bit of their website and there's lots of fact sheets there about individual drugs and their adverse effects. <laughs>